Hi, this is Caillou's dad, Boris, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaum, and today's are our co-hosts, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingle. How are you guys doing? We're good. Doing good, Jakey. How you doing? That's great here. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. So, Chris, Wonderful. what do we have for today? Our guest for today, he is an actor and voice actor. A lot of you may know him in the voiceover world as the voice of Rocco and Spunky on Rocco's Modern Life, uh, Winslow and Lube and cat dog uh mr crocker and the fairly odd parents um uh, for his on-camera things he uh play he was on uh, reno 911 um and we're here to talk about that and a whole bunch of other things he's done too here he is carlos alzaraki carlos happy to have you here hey everybody happy to be here happy awesome. to have you yes awesome so to kick things off even though i kind of did a little bit already in your own words could you kind of introduce yourself a bit and what you do yeah, I'm Carlos Ellis Rocky. I'm a actor, voice actor living in Burbank, California. Two daughters. Uh, my daughter Riley is um, actually the voice of uh, Rock Talk on Star Trek Prodigy. So proud dad brag. But uh, yeah, I started out uh, in voiceover from comedy as Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life and Spunky. <laughs> and that sort of kicked me into the world of voiceover where I soon followed with Spyro the Dragon, the OG, Watch Out for Nasty Nork, and Cat Dog, uh, Winslow. Hey, Cat Dog. And wow, wow, wubsy. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm a Phillips head screwdriver. And on and on. And now I'm doing the Casa Grandes uh, and some other things that we can talk about later. Uh, Mr. Weed on the Family Guy. Peter, you're fired. Bane uh, from uh, Legion Doom, I guess. First I broke the bat. Today I break the man. And on and on and on. And so I've been able to parlay uh, voiceover work since 1991 as the first pilot we ever did for Rocco. And here I am, still going. Awesome. Wow. wow. Awesome. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So what was your background like and how did you grow up? Background kind of feeds into to all the whole voiceover wor world. Blue collar suburbs in Concord, California, uh, East Bay, San Francisco, paper route, jock, sports, hide and seek, always outdoors, always doing stuff, but always watching television and imitating people because – my parents from Argentina, my mom from a place called Rosario. My dad was from Loma, but British educated. So no accent. My mom thick Carlitos, no me digas. And then my best friend, uh, Kevin, his parents were from Glasgow, Scotland. So if I wasn't at home with my parents saying, Carlitos, no me digas, I was hearing Carlos and Kevin, why don't you just go outside? So. Right away, I was just drawn to dialects and voices and characters. And, of course, I watched cartoons and Dawes Butler and oh, yes. all the greats from Hanna-Barbera. Mm -hmm. Hey, you jinxie. Hey, you pixie. Hey, you made three make those nieces to pieces and all that. Good. Hey, you bubble Louie. Hi, quick throw. Here comes the gun fighter. So <laughs> after school, watching that, imitating Herman Munster, I won't, I won't, I won't. And I was just a suburban kid that loved to imitate people and do voices and watching Monty Python and the Ripping Yarns and uh, Faulty Towers, all kinds of British television. So there were voices and dialects and characters all around me. And then in college, I had a Filipino college professor. And when I was doing stand-up in San Francisco, there were I was banking at a Chinese bank. I was near a Russian neighborhood. I was hearing... Uh, this the going to to Selma to the Sedimenti Center, where is where there were a lot of Filipino people, and so later on I imitated that and my uh, college professor Edilberto Cajucam, who you can catch an homage to if you have YouTube. We did a series called um, uh, Off the Curb with Fred Tatashore, Cedric Yarborough, Gary Anthony Williams, uh, John DiMaggio, and later on Eric Bauza. It's called Off the Curb. It's all improv. But I imitated Eddie Milter Kohukam, who was my professor for 
for two years in recreation administration. Oh, wow. And later on, I was able to parlay that into a job as Anton uh, Trece in the uh, graphic novel depiction of uh, the animated show Trece. So just growing up in this blue-collar neighborhood, but really paying attention to all kinds of characters and dialects and being fascinated with it all. While I was a guy that wasn't in drama, I was playing sports. And then right around 1985, I got involved in stand-up comedy and then just started taking off with that. So that's a long-winded history, but that's kind of how I got involved in voiceover. Nice. Awesome. Thanks. So what made you want to get into acting and comedy? I think it was the Carol Burnett show when I was a kid. I loved Harvey Carman. I loved Tim Conway. I loved Carol Burnett. Uh, uh, Lawrence, Car I want to say Carolyn Lawrence, but it's, uh, oh my gosh, what's her name? Vicki Lawrence. Um, and I, I just loved all that stuff. We had a Bill Cosby comedy album. I had Cheech and Chong comedy album growing up, Los Cochinos. Hope the speaker reaches. Fuchi Capesta. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hey man, <laughs> Dave's not here, man. I so I just loved all of it, and I I think it was all those, all those influences, and plus I I was a major in recreation administration, and in, in college I was going to work at a racquetball club or a tennis club or work in a ski resort. I was going to work at a corporate recreation where I would take corporate employees through zip lines and trust falls because I love sports and I was also funny, but then. Once I started do doing stand-up comedy, I went, wow, this is kind of a path to getting where I wanted to be on camera. You know, oh, I could get Saturday Night Live or something. And then voiceover came in as sort of a side shoot from it. Mm. And once I started doing that, I was like, wow, I really love this. And it does allow me to be anybody. You know, a kid named Carlos Jaime Alasraqui, whose parents were from South America, who won the All-American Boy Award at my senior banquet, started with an Australian wallaby. So anything <laughs> was possible, right? You could be anybody with voiceover. You didn't have to lurk or look a certain way. Right. And uh, that's that's mm -hmm. what led me to fall in love with it, with just all those influences and then like, this is awesome. Mm. Awesome. Awesome, amazing. So can you share any stand-up comedy stories f from over the years? Gosh, there was, there was a lot, you know. I, I did so many, some were really what we would call hell gigs on the road where you'd have to turn off a playoff hockey game in, in Spokane, Washington, like, we're watching the game. Yeah, but we have some comedians. You know, like, oh, boy, this is going to be terrible. You know, to doing outdoor gigs, the, the, the brouhaha, which was a San Jose, California beer festival outside, and a bunch of guys on their Harleys behind the stage just like, ring, 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 like, oh, man. But having a blast with Cedric Yarborough doing college gigs, and then I had met Robin Williams in San Francisco many times. And then we started working on Happy Feet, the both Happy Feets together. And one oh, magic yeah. night where we were out in uh, Sydney and me and Jeff Garcia were going out every night to do stand up in Sydney after records. And one night Robin's like, hey, do you mind if I tag along with you guys? And Elijah Wood came and Robin came, the writer of. Uh, the movie, the sequel, was Gary Eck, an Australian comedian. We went to this club called the, I want to say it was called the Sugar Cube or the Sugar Bear, the Sugar Cube. What was it called? It was in Sydney. It's no longer there. It was a little bar. Robin came with us. They coaxed him up on stage. We all did comedy that night, and Robin closed the show. And it was one magic, the best magical night of comedy that will never be again. Wow. And I'll always, that was 2009 in January. And then a couple months later, I was doing a show in Novato, and I knew Rebecca and Dan Spencer, his assistants through comedy. And I said, I'm going to be in Novato. And Robin came out to this small, tiny Mexican restaurant to come watch me perform. And he got up on stage and did it again. And those were two like magical, wonderful nights of comedy that, you know, I'll never forget. Pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, um, definitely. Wonderful. Definitely. So I know uh, you kind of touched up on this in the beginning, but um, onto your acting, one of your most known voice acting girls, of course, voicing Rocco and Rocco and Spunky on uh, Rocco's Modern Life. Can yeah. you uh, kind of talk about the uh, audition process for that? It was. I didn't have an agent. I was in Sacramento doing stand up comedy. I had a manager, Tracy Forrester, friends with a guy named Robert McNamara. I want to say his name was 
producer at San Francisco State and a professor producing, helping Joe Murray produce this pilot based on some of the drawings and ideas that he had had. He was a San Jose Mercury newspaper uh, panelist, uh, panel cartoonist. Hmm. And I got an audition. I pushed, I had a tape recorder, pushed play and record in a kitchen in Sacramento while I was on the road at Laughs Unlimited. And I got the audition without an agent. I went to a house in San Francisco near the Sutro Towers. And inside the garage basement, there were actors lined up going in. And I was one of them, and I went in. George Maestri, Nick Jennings, and Joe Murray were there. And they said, we don't want Australian. We don't want Australian. It's too nail on the head. He's a wallaby. So let's try something different, like a Woody Allen. Let's try like a, a Bruno Kirby, who was, if you watch Good Morning Vietnam, it's like, I do characters too. Hello, Frenchie. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's funny? I can be <laughs> funny too. That's the actor Bruno Kirby. So I was doing takes like that. It wasn't working, and his legend would have it. And I just told... Jim Meskimen on on TikTok because Jim was reading a, a manual. I said that's pretty much what happened with Rocco. I saw these jolly teeth and a long snout, and I said, "Can I just read this vacuum manual? When you're cleaning the unit, make sure that the unit itself is not plugged into an outlet because electrocution could occur." And they're like, "Wow, that sounds kind of fun. Let's try that." And so I did it. They sent it off to Mary Harrington and the folks at Nickelodeon. They said, "Yeah, we like that voice. Let's make a pilot." I'm like, "Oh, wow." The very first voice I got was Spunky. Mm, okay. I saw this dog with mm. weird eyes. And, and Nick Jennings literally <laughs> leaps out of his chair and goes, that's Spunky, you're Spunky. And I went, oh, good, I'm Spunky. <laughs> and we started talking about voices, and I did said, I love Gene Wilder and Young Frankenstein. And I did the little bit, you are not evil, you are good. And it made him laugh, and it kept me in the room. And then I did the manual thing, and then we did a pilot at Poolside Studios on the straight part of Lombard Street, Lombard and Steiner, which is just down the road, I would guess you would say, the south of uh, Broadway and Steiner, which is where the Mrs. Doubtfire house is. And we did a little, re little pilot. Uh, and I was on the road in Seattle, Washington, at Last Laugh Comedy Club, I got a call on my pager. I called back, and they said, "We're Rocco's Modern Life has been picked up to go to series. In 1991, I got that call. And wow. I was so excited. Oh, wow. So excited. Oh, because that was pulling me off so... the road as a stand-up, which was not um, where I wanted to be uh, long-term. Right, definitely. Yeah, Rocco's Modern Life's a good show. I remember watching – well, because it, cause it was in the 90s, and that was kind of before my time. I watched a lot of it, you know, on – reruns but i remember seeing the show a lot uh, back in the day mm -hmm. and of yeah. course you can see in my background i have the complete series set too yeah oh that's great yeah yes that's awesome Definitely. the book set yes that's the one we recorded at the downtown independent theater uh and yeah we, we we got a video of it and everything we and uh we handed we handed those out as well or we had the individual seasons out there and then from that Shout Box, I think, is the company made uh, the, the the box set, mm -hmm. which I I don't even know if I own it, but um, it's good for me to hear episodes from fans because sometimes I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't being that long ago, you know, the, you probably don't even remember at all. No, it was 1991, 1995. <laughs> I was 33, I guess, at the time. Right, even even in my thirties, lucky I started so late. But um, yeah, so many years have passed, and I go to cons and I and I hear people and they'll give me a line and they'll say, "What's your favorite line?" And my favorite line from Rocco is pretty obscure. He's going through his garage toys, and I do a bad Nick Nolte character, and I Rocco finds him, and he's shaped like an onion. He's like, "Who are you? <laughs> Don't you remember Rocco? I'm your favorite childhood toy, Mr. Onion Head." And Rocco squeezes him and says, I love you, Mr. Onion Head. And that's one of my favorite <laughs> lines ever because it's just so strange uh -huh. and full of so much emotion. But, yeah, what yeah. I remember about Rocco is he was my first. He's so full of emotion. He's so subtle. He's Winnie the Pooh. He's he's always positive. Yeah, I could see that, he, yeah. yeah. Even though yeah, he I has see his it. battles. I see a little bit of Winnie the Pooh in him. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody likes him, you know. <laughs> Winnie may not get as angry as Rocco because Rocco's a little bit older. I would say Laszlo. Hey, Scoutmaster Lumpy. Oh, yeah. Is a little closer to Winnie the Pooh, but there's qualities of Winnie in both of those characters for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. So, do you have any favorite 
Rocco's Modern Life episodes? Yeah, it's always a good question, and it's hard for me to remember them. Um, yeah, uh, I like the Christmas episode. You can't squeeze cheer, cheer from a Christmas log or from a Yule log. And I just like it, I not for the line so much, but because Rocco is so nice to that little elf who's nervous and out in the world. He's like, hello, little elf. Don't be afraid of us. We're your neighbors. You know, he's so sweet in that episode. Of course, yeah. when he's Filbert's boss. Filbert! Uh, or the driving <laughs> instructor. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I would say the Christmas episode is my favorite because Rocco is so sweet in it. Do you have some favorite episodes of yours? Yeah, I really like the um the two part uh, wacky deli. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, I have the yeah. cheese. Hello, I'm Betty Balloonia. <laughs> and of course, we sort of bring that back the uh, the fat heads in Static <laughs> Cling. You know, we, mm -hmm. we're learning yes. how to make. Uh, we're learning how to make an animated cartoon. First, draw the cartoons, then create the characters. I'm Betty Bologna. <laughs> and then Doug Lawrence going, I am the cheese. I am the most important part of the film. <laughs> yeah, that was a lovely one. Wacky Deli's crazy. Uh, there's a lot of good ones. And um, you mentioned yes. uh, Static Cling. What was it like getting to kind of come back to those characters? I, I tell people it was like, it was like being in the band The Who or The Rolling Stones where we've had all, or Pink Floyd, like Roger Waters calling David Gilmore, like, hey guys, would you like to get together and, and play one more live concert, you know, do a couple of tour dates together? And we're like, yeah, I can still play. Let's get together for rehearsals, right? Get back, we're like the Beatles. And we got back together and we had to find our voices and we're like, man, those were way up high. You know, Rocco is high, way higher than I thought. And Tom was like, really? I sound like that? I don't know if I can get there. And Charlie was Charlie. He's got a leather <laughs> Oh, Ben, dear. Don't worry about it, Rocco. You know, we are all just so thrilled to be doing these voices again and working together. And, and Mr. Lawrence, and we had a blast. I have so much BTS behind the scenes footage. You know, oh, my gosh. It, oh, wow. it, was, it was just wonderful. It was wonderful because we didn't think we'd have this opportunity again. So... Having getting to record it in 2016 and then waiting pretty much until 2019, I think, for it to come out on Netflix was pretty amazing. Yeah, and that was around the oh, time yeah. that a lot of like Nickelodeon shows were coming back too. Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. they did the hey, that uh, Hey Arnold, uh, the Jungle movie. Yes, yeah, that's right. I played Eduardo. The, yes, the that's, real right. Eduardo. that's right. That's mm right. -hmm. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we. Uh, I loved it. I revere it. I love those guys. I love when I get to see them. I saw Tom Ken and Tom Kenny and, and Doug Lawrence. I posted the picture the other night at the uh, Patrick Star Rap Show down at the Union Station, and we just posed for a picture. And like whenever you know, we're trying to get some sort of Rocco thing going live again. We did one in SuperCon Florida in 2015, I think, just before oh. we came out, just before oh. we knew we were going to record Rocco again. We read Cabin Fever. Oh, oh, yes. That's, that's oh, another good yes. one. Yeah. Love that episode. Well, we had this cabin first. Oh, yeah. Ed, just share the cabin with them. <laughs> yeah. So it was just amazing. Amazing to come back and, and be with the band again, as it were, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. It's great. Of course. Of course, always is. So you also voiced the characters Winslow and Lube in another Nicktoon, Cat Dog. What a great show as well. Peter Hannon. Yes. And Dwight Schultz, Such... Jim Cummings, Tom Kenny, Maria oh Bamford, yeah. uh, Billy West. Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of so wonderful many. guests on that show. And yeah. What are you nuts? I just bought U <laughs> Two's has a Winslow figure out there, fans. If you want to buy it and meet me at a con, U Two's is the brand. It's got a Winslow finger figure coming out of a mouse mouse door and it's awesome. It's really detailed. Oh, wow. It's really detailed. Wow. It took a while to get here, but I got it. Um, nice. but cool. yeah, I love Winslow Awesome, because Tom and, and Jim were so brilliant at playing both parts of cat dog and their person. And there's a guy that's like, what are you guys up to? <laughs> a hanger on or, you know, a leecher. <laughs> and then, uh, lube was part of the greasers. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. if you notice clam <laughs> from Laszlo is just a short, more staccato version of lube. Because Lube would be like, hey, you cat dog. And, and Clem would be like, ah, hey, cat dog. 
So <laughs> kind of borrowed from boy. And you know, Laszlo is kind of like a young, younger, more innocent Rocco. But I, I really love being, you know, Winslow was the opposite of Rocco. Not mm. nice, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so very fun to play. Too bad you can't go outside, cat dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's rubbing it in and twisting the knife. For those listening, the uh, the U twos is spelled Y O U T O O Z. That's yes. U twos dot com for more information. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. yes. So now, one of your uh, longest running voice jobs was voicing Mr. Crocker in the Fairly yeah. Odd Parents. What, what was it like getting to work on that show? Timmy Tudu. The very first voice I did for Butch was Billy Crystal Ball. And this was back before I, I've been doing Mike Wazowski sound like stuff since 2001. Kingdom Hearts 3, the game, I can officially say I got to play the character Mike Wazowski because obviously it's Billy Crystal. But obviously he, he's not available or they, they pass on, like much like Jim Hanks is doing Tom, Tom Hanks Woody. Mm. Uh, I do a lot of Billy Crystal sound like, and I got way better at it. But I sort of did a like, hi, hey, I'm Billy Crystal Ball for Butch. And then. He had a character that's part of another pilot that he pitched that didn't go who thought, I think he'll fit in well as a school teacher at Timmy's school, and it was Mr. Crocker. And so we kind Mm. of got together and collaborated and had ideas. And I've said this many times in many interviews that because people will say, wow, Mr. Crocker sounds a lot like Montgomery Burns. And I said, well, yeah, it's because I'm stealing from the best. You know, (laughs) Harry Shearer, he's he's incredible. Um, And so, yeah, Crocker was sort of a, a mix of Mr. Burns, Sped up, more manicky, with Richard Dreyfus. I don't like panties hanging on the rod. This shark is way too big for this boat. And Gene Wilder, <laughs> send a give. And you blend them all together. And it's Timmy <laughs> Turner. I know you have. Hey, God, birds. So <laughs> it has that Montgomery Burns quality. It has Richard Dreyfus. It has Gene Wilder all mixed together. And putting it together with Butch and his mad <laughs> mind was. A blast. And then, of course, we recently went to SAC Anime in Roseville, California, with Suzanne Blakesley, Darren Norris, uh, Tara Strong, myself, and Butch Hartman. And we did a panel. And it's wow. wonderful because that was a very symphonic cartoon that was very fast paced, very deliberate, much more deliberate than, than Rocco's pace with Joe Murray. And just a blast to be a part of that cast. And you got to keep up because Darren, oh yeah, they're all brilliant. Mm. And and of course, Gray Delisle was with us as well, playing Vicky and Miss Waxelplax. So we had a full panel. We're looking to do more of those as well. So hopefully we can put awesome. some more together. But yeah. it, just a blast. I love that that show. And uh, I'm playing. I'm doing the new Fairly Odd Parents. I did the live action one as well. Yeah. Getting to play him mm-hmm. live was fascinating and exhausting <laughs> and a lot of cred to the other actor the canadian actor who played him in the other movies because it's harder than it looks to fully play him physically from head to toe you know mm. i'm just doing this from here to here but uh yeah if we can i, I i'm playing uh, mr gooseman in the in the new fairly odd parents and there may or may not be an appearance of mr crocker i can't say for certain but uh so Anytime I get to play Mr. Crocker, anytime I get to hang out with the cast, the creator of Fairly Odd Parents Butch, I am in uh, heaven. So, love, love, love. Mm. Ping! Mr. Crocker, Timmy Tooney. Lots of fun. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes. It's a yeah, great show, too. So, yes. So, you also voice Scooter and various other fish in another mm-hmm. long wing Nickelodeon series, SpongeBob SquarePants. What was That's that like? Right. That was fun. Now, of course, on uh, Camp Coral, I play Nobby, who's like, Hey, Mom, we're going to get, get over there. We're going to go see it. Yeah, we're going to have fun. <laughs> and uh, I play this guy, Harvey. <laughs> Guys, they're aliens. I swear, they're coming to Camp Coral. The camp is missing trouble, guys. So, but, um,. Hey, SpongeBob, you ripped your pants. Ha ha ha, I tied. <laughs> Tell everybody famously, and I'll say it again. That was borrowed from a guy, Dave, who used to work in our liquor store, Candlelight Liquors, who had a laugh like, ha ha ha. And Mike Pace, a very funny comedian. Look up Mike Pace, uh, originally from St. Louis, who used to do a, a, a surfer character because Mike was a surfer when he moved to San Diego. What's up, Mike? What's up, dude? You going to come out and surf? Ha ha. So I kind of blend them together, and it was like, you ripped your pants. That was awesome. <laughs> so again, borrowing from friends and, and other and other sources and, uh. and putting a character together. But, yeah, Scooter's mm-hmm. awesome. 
Oh, oh yeah. Scooter. Hopefully. Scooter's Love great. to see more of Scooter on Spongebob, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd yeah. be great. Yeah. I don't know that Hillenburg was uh, a fan of Scooter so much, only because Steve didn't want to hit the surfer dude stuff nail on the head. He wanted to talk mm. about the ocean. And I think that he probably felt that if a bunch of dudes were talking like this, even though the seagulls in the film with Antonio Banderas are kind of like that, I think Steve's mission was to do characters that were not uh, associated with the beach per se. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's the reason that Scooter wasn't as popular. But mm -hmm. I was so pleased. Steve came out of Rocco. Uh, right, yeah. And Derek Dryman as well. And just to be a part of SpongeBob in any facet, you know, and I, I worked with Tom and, and Dee yesterday on uh, the Patrick Star Show, mm. and I told them, I go, oh, yeah. I revere you guys. You guys are legends. It's like swimming with dolphins. And not, <laughs> you know, not <laughs> not a, a uh, metaphor because it's a sea show, but just because they're they're amazing. And so, yeah, just being part of SpongeBob in any fashion has been wonderful. Goofy Goober oh, yeah. Clock. It's the Goofy Goober yeah, Show. Uh -huh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh -huh, yes. Yes. I actually have to do that because I know Tara is doing her her Miss, Mrs. Clocks right for the for Loki. So maybe I should b break out a goofy goober picture and take it on the road. That's the thing is like when I do a con, I never know what's going to be popular. And you'll probably get to this. Uh, being the original Spyro the Dragon has really resonated with a lot more people than I thought because of course mm -hmm. you had Elijah Wood and John, yeah, uh, Jess yeah, Arnell, uh -huh. of course Tom Kenny in the in uh, mm -hmm. the digitized remaster one and, and the third one. But just that 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 game and working with Clancy Brown as a young actor was amazing. So you never know what's going to resonate with people. And, yeah, I love Spider yeah. Dragon. So maybe Goofy Goober. Maybe somebody wants to hear the Goofy Goober show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yes, that'd, yeah. be, that'd be yeah. awesome. Yes, that would be awesome. Yeah, and uh, and you also voiced Walton in Nick Jr. series Robo Wubsy. Well, yes, Robo Wubsy. Bob Boyle, what Seen a fun one, show! So. And colors of the colors, the yeah. palleted colors of yellows and purples and blues. And yeah, I want mm -hmm. a kickity kickball. I was the mailman and the fireman, which is why they all sounded the same. I did all the male voices except for a couple that Jeff Bennett did. But yeah, Walden was an, again another Australian character, very can do. Oh my dino bones! Oh no, I've lost my dino bones, but don't worry. I can fix it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Just a fun, happy, you know, you you wish like everybody lived in in Wubsyville, you know? And Great yeah. Hill was, you know, like, kickity kickball. She was wonderful as Wubsy and oh, yeah. Tara Strong oh, and yes. Daly. And she did, mm -hmm. She's done wonderful, lots of colorful, things, too, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love playing Walden, though. The purple genius. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it was a definitely a wonderful show that we grew up with. Oh yeah, yes. fantastic, show. fantastic show. Now moving on from Nickelodeon on PBS, you voiced Paco the parrot and Maya and Miguel. Yeah, another another show we grew up with. Yes. Now what was it? What was it like working and voicing on a show with a Hispanic family? That was great. That was, that was Kenny Milo and Nika Futterman. Um, yeah, uh -huh. the other characters and uh, Ontiveros, Lupe Ontiveros, she, she passed away. She was a wonderful actress, of, of course. Um, and it was great because I think outside of the Taco Bell, maybe predating the Taco Bell right around the same time, Yo Quiero Taco Bell, that might have been my introduction, uh, aside from Juan Dissimo, although I think it predated Juan Dissimo and, and Fairly Odd. I loved it. And I think Paco. Paco, oh boy, was is a little less acerbic and sardonic than um, uh, Sergio on Casa Grande. Sergio's like, oh, whatever. Sergio has way more <laughs> attitude. Paco was just like, oh boy, I hear Miguel. A little bit happier, I think. Yeah, but pretty definitely. great to be a part of that show for sure. Um, I loved it. I loved, yeah, that I actually get to use a little bit of my heritage, my ability to hear and pronounce Spanish words and say them in spanish pretty cool stretched me out you know it was it was nice yeah and on yes. the on the subject of uh shows with uh hispanic characters what was it like working on uh el tigre because i know you did some work on that show as well yeah i did the original pilot of pepe the bull for um uh, jorge gutierrez and sandra Iquiwa. i met them at la studios on this disney's project pepe the bull and eventually they went with mario lopez and eventually the show didn't go and then el tigre came around and 
I play grandpappy. Who is based on a woman named Raquel, who was a grandma who lived next to us when I was a kid. And she smoked a lot. And she would go, Shelly, Dana, you have to go by his side. It's time to come home. <laughs> and so I went, oh boy, I love that voice. And so I later on became grandpappy. Maria, Mani Rivera. <laughs> and uh, Jorge and Sandra are brilliant, working with, oh gosh, what's her name from Wilding Out? I want to say Allison. Uh, Allie, oh gosh. She was wonderful as LT Gray. I'm sorry I'm blanking on her name. Great Delisle, John DiMaggio, Eric Bauza played my, my son. Um, but a great cast, lots of fun, beautiful cartoon. And of course, it led to Book of Life. Oh, um, yes, Book of Life. Where movie. General Posada is just a little bit deeper than Grandpappy is here and Posada is down here and then Chacol is down here. Chacol was in <laughs> my end of three, but yeah, any my relationship born out of that series, Pepe de Bull and El Tigre, has continued with Jorge Gutierrez. And again, swimming with dolphins. He's brilliant. Anytime mm -hmm. I get to work with him, I'm, I'm in voiceover heaven, so... Absolutely. Just El Tigre yeah. was great, and I wish it would come back. Yeah, yeah. that would be that would be cool to I see mean, a reboot. Oh yes. yes, yes. So moving on to Playhouse Disney, you worked on the series Handy Manny, voicing one of the tools, Felipe. Can you talk yeah. about that? Felipe and and uh, grandfather too. Hola, herramientas. What is happening today? And. I'm a Phillips head screwdriver, Manny. And I would always get in fights with Turner, who was played by D. Bradley Baker. He wants yeah. a flathead. I don't know. Maybe he wants a Phillips head. So, wonderful. I was the original voice of Manny, and then replaced really? by Wilmer Balderrama. Huh. Yeah. Um, I was the original voice. Um, and he might have sounded like, Okay, Tools, let's get ready to go outside. It's going to be a long day in the park. But uh, Wilmer was great. He really gave some earthiness to it, some some humility, some warmth. He did a great job. And so transitioning back over to doing the other characters was fun. Tom Kenny, uh, mm. Fred Stola, Kath Susie, Nika Futterman, D. Bradley Baker. Um, just a wonderful cast. Again, just a lot of fun playing on that show. I love huh. it. Nice. Definitely. Yeah, great, great yeah I haven't show. seen Handy Manny in a long time. I know it's on Disney Plus. So I got to watch it again. Hey, it's, yeah. it's been a long time since I've seen Same it here. as well. Same here. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of Bob the Builder ish, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. 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 No. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Tom is brilliant as Mr. Low Park. Oh, hi, man. Oh, yes. Oh, no, I can manage myself. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. you don't want help with it, Mr. Low Park? No, no, I've got it myself. <laughs> yeah, he was great. Yeah, you know the more the more I think about it, the more I think that Handy Manny was Disney's answer to Bob the Builder. Honestly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, why not? And why not? A little bit of, col yeah. little bit of culture why as not? well. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So over on the Cartoon Network side of things, you were also Laszlo, among others, in the Cartoon Network series Camp Laszlo. Yeah, and I just saw TikTok, and here's a little bit of trivia. I'm the only one of the characters that's not part of the opening title song. <laughs> I, I did not get invited to sing my own title song. Oh. So you don't, you don't hear Laszlo <laughs> or any of my characters are in there at all. Um, Interesting. Yeah, wow, that's, a little bit of trivia. Oh, no. But I loved it. It was a Joe Marie project again. Love working yes. with Joe. And I says, as I said, Laszlo was a really sort of more innocent version. Come on, Bean Scouts. Let's go camping. Little, same octave as Rocco, but more innocent, younger, mm -hmm. and more wide-eyed. Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, Clem was a sped-up version of Loop. Uh, yeah, fast both. Uh, and Jeff Bennett was brilliant as Raj. Oh, Laszlo. We have to watch out, Laszlo. Steve <laughs> Little as the Beatles. <laughs> hey, Laszlo. And I played the... Uh, the cafeteria guy were having fresh vegetables. <laughs> and Laszlo was wonderful, wonderfully drawn, wonderfully colored. They had scenes at night with campfires, full of adventure. Um, I have a Camp Laszlo sleeping bag. It's at my brother's place. It's it's pretty in pretty good condition. Oh, I wow. love Camp Laszlo. And, and I was going in Reno pretty strong at the time, so I couldn't oh. always be with the cast, but... <laughs> 
I just love how sweet Laszlo is. I love that theme of camping. And of course, Camp Coral, I think, is pretty derivative of that kind of whole camping theme. But uh, yeah, Laszlo was great. Yeah. Laszlo was great. Yes. Uh, that was great. Now, kind of moving on from your voice roles for a TV series, you brought up earlier you voiced the Taco Bell Chihuahua and the Taco Bell commercials. What, what was it like recording for those? Pretty fun audition, you know, which I thought was a waste of time. Four words on a piece of paper to drive an hour from the valley to the west side. Going, oh, what a waste of time. Whatever. You don't get up. She, my Terry Berland said, don't go high. Everybody's going high. Just do your own voice and add some bass to it. Ugh, whatever. Yo quiero Taco Bell. All right. Thank you. Bye. What a waste of time. Mm. And we made a demo, <laughs> and then we did the commercial. Yo quiero Taco Bell. And then, what is the logarithm? He, lizard, lizard, viva gorditas. Then it's taking off. Incredible. Surreal. On Hollywood Squares. Playing in a Dodger game, pre-baseball, softball game. On the Dodger Stadium, you know, pitch, as it were. The field. Being in Hollywood Squares with Whoopi Goldberg and meeting Sugar Ray Leonard and talking to him. Like, all because I was like, what is a logarithm? You know, <laughs> can't this boat go any faster? And my favorite crossover commercial with the Colonel and the Army, the Star Wars Army is coming over the hill, and I look at Colonel Sanders. You're a real Colonel, right? <laughs> uh, so it was a blast. I got merchandising deals. I got a bunch of money. I bought a house in the Valley. I was doing weekly recordings of another commercial and another commercial. It was just surreal. It was incredible. Uh, I loved it awesome. as well. That's Very funny. lucky. Pinch me. <laughs> <laughs> so you also filled in, in for Billy Crystal voicing Mike Wasowski and a few monster few different monster in commercials and merchandise. Can you, yeah, can you talk a bit about minivan. those? Great idea, huh, Sully. Hide under the van. That was a Chrysler minivan one. Uh, the Monster Scare Floor at Florida. If you go where I that one, it's me. All right, everybody, text in your jokes. Five more minutes. You're going to have oh, a great yeah. time. Yeah, I got to see myself. It was meta. <laughs> everybody had a great time at the show. Except for that guy in the hat. Right there. And then, yeah, a lot of games, a lot of projects. Kingdom Hearts 3. I've probably done hundreds of hours of Billy Crystal attempting to to really emulate what he does. And, and you know, what a great character that B Billy Crystal has created with Mike Wazowski with all the peaks and valleys and subtleties and shame and fright and confidence. He just really nails it. And then, you know, it's my job to make you believe that, hey, Raj, you're looking good today. Will you cut it out, Sully? Get out of here, my one eye. <laughs> my job to make you believe that you're hearing the real thing. But what a great template that was set by Billy Crystal. What a, a wonderful character to get to play. And uh, that's one of my the ones that I'm most proud of, you know, because it took some skill that I didn't know I had. And it took right. a lot of practice. I talked to Wally Wingert about it because he is uh, mm. Jack Black. And, of course, Fred Tattashore doing Dustin Hoffman's Sifu in, in, in Kung Fu Panda. You know, a lot of work goes into voice matching. And Absolutely, it's really yeah. rewarding, you know, where, where people are like, I had no idea. I thought that was the real Billy Crystal. I was like, nope, that was me. So... <laughs> You know, and then sometimes I listen and I go, oh, I'm a little off there. I got a little uh, away from the Bronx accent on that one. But, you know, that one, that one is good. I like that one. So <laughs> it's always a challenge. And, I, right. uh, yeah, it's just it's good to challenge yourself. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Definitely. That was good. That Definitely. was good. So moving on to some of your on-camera acting roles, you played Deputy James Garcia in the mockumentary. That's right, folks. Mockumentary series. Reno nine one one. I don't know if these even fit over that, but yeah, this guy right here. Since nineteen or two thousand one, we were doing a pilot, and they uh, told us to go home and think about some characters because our sketch show wasn't going to go with Fox. So we're going to make fun of cops. Go home and think of about a character, and a lot of Barney Fife in this guy, a lot of self righteousness and self importance, but just a fool. All right. And, uh, yeah, James Garcia was born in 2001, just made it up on the spot and came to set, and they asked me a bunch of questions. I like bear claws. A cop is a protective rainbow stretching over the entire city, county, country area. Cop stands for count on my protection, coming through. Yeah, we're just making those things up on the fly and, and acting with Tom and Carrie and 
Ben and C.J. Yarborough, Miss Jones as my partner, and Nisi Nash, and later on, Wendy and Mary, and then of course we add Ian Roberts and Joe Latrulio, and just again swimming with dolphins. I'm getting to play hmm. this fake cop sitting in a car with, with Kenny Rogers, making dialogue up and bugging him, and doing all kinds of weird stuff, and shooting fake guns, and pretending to be a cop, and getting hit by eggs in the cemetery. You know, <laughs> all fun, all fun. I got to play cops and robbers as an adult and got paid for it. Still yeah. do every once in a while. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that was a good show. I remember, I remember seeing it uh, when it was on a couple uh, years ago. And of course, uh, I know Jake also wanted to ask about the uh, revival yeah. series that you did. Yet. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What's the like we're doing that? Again, fun to like we're getting the band back together again. It, we did a, I think ten years after I had come off in two thousand nine, maybe at about twenty sixteen, we did a promotion for a sheriff running for office in back in Carson where we filmed. And we got together, and Nisi Nash was on this bus that we drove down saying, we got to do this show again, guys. we got to do Reno. we got to do it. we got to do it. And you think, ah, it'll never happen. And then in 2018, they give us a call that says, yeah, you know, let's meet together in December of 2018. We're going to come back and do a season in 2019. And we were back again. And I couldn't believe it, you know. And here we were, and making new stuff out in Piru, California. And then we come back again to do stuff for Quibi, which falls apart the day that Jamie Lee Curtis was with us. We said, just keep filming stuff. And then, of course, that ends up on Roku and Comedy Central. Then we do two more movies, uh, Search for Q and uh, It's a Wonderful Heist. And then just recently I did a commercial spot that aired in theaters before Scream with uh, Carrie and Tom. Hmm. So it just keeps going. And being part of the new stuff is kind of fun. You know, I've, Absolutely, I like yeah. playing this guy. I, I'm I'm mm -hmm. so lucky that these characters are evergreen and they can come back again. So yeah, again, once again, just a blast working yeah. with people I have no business working with. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you you kind of touched up on this earlier. Over the years, you've mentioned uh, this earlier. You've appeared at various conventions yeah. th across the country. What's it like getting to interact with fans who have enjoyed your work over the years? I'll tell another story, which I've told several times, right? On the voice of Spyro the Dragon, a voice that I did right after Rocco that I thought, eh, it's okay. It's an okay voice, right? He's like a lot of uh, Rankin and Bass, Rudolph and him. What about Nasty mm. Nork? I'm going after him. No, I'm not afraid of that abominable snowman. You know, same kind of qualities. Um, I'm going to, he's Nasty Nork is toast. I don't think like the most magical <laughs> voice ever, but it really resonates with people. Like, no, yeah. you were my whole life. You were my childhood. I played Spyro when I was in the hospital. And I never thought, I never got why it was so important to people. And then one day I'm in the lobby of Salami Studios talking about how I stink at video games. I'm no good, especially first person shooter. I don't know what I'm doing. No. I'm spinning in circles. <laughs> Me the neither. Only I, the only <laughs> game I know how to play is Left 4 Dead. Mm. At first, and I know Vince Valenzuela, who plays Francis. Hey guys, I need a, I need some, I need some backup here. I need some medical attention. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then I play Left 4 Dead too, because <laughs> you can use a, a hatchet and a saw and a saw and a sword and guitars and and I'm pretty good at it. I'm not bad on normal, and I'm playing it hours and hours and hours and hours. And I said to Fred and D, I go, I only know how to play Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead too. And and D looks at me and goes, you know, I'm the Joker, the guy that jumps on your head and the spitter mm -hmm. and, and, and the one that the smoker, I play all. And Fred goes, yeah, I play Boomer. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. No way, no way. You guys are kidding me. I love you guys. And that's when it hit me. <laughs> that's why it's so important to people because you, they spend so many hours with Spyro or Rocco or Crocker. And I spent so many hours with Fred and D and I had no idea and of course I was a fanboy. Of course I'm going to love them more now. Because, yeah, you're D, D Baker, who I know, and Fred, who I know. But you're you're Boomer, dude. And you're the spitter. And you're the joker. You're much more than just my friends now. Sorry. I'm going to be <laughs> awkward around you. So it's incredible. Awesome. It's incredible the, the feedback that you get from people. And now you know. Yeah. You don't yep. question when they say, hey, man, you helped me through a tough time. Or... I just want to tell you that voice that you did meant so much to me. And you're like, yeah, 
I get it now. Uh, thank you. And thank you for being mm -hmm. a fan of voiceover actors because sometimes we, we're not like the big A-lister celebrities. Sometimes we do look, get lucked over. But for somebody to notice what we do is pretty amazing. And yeah, I'll take it all day, 24-7, eight days a week. I love it. Uh, definitely. Wonderful. So now we've covered a lot of your past work, but is there anything you're currently working on that you can share? Yeah, um, I believe so. Rock, paper, scissors. There's been a couple little demos out there. I play scissors along with um, Tom Lennon from Reno, who plays paper, and Ron Funches, who plays rock. A lot of guest guest uh, roles in there. Eddie Pepitone, Cedric Yarbrough. Uh, a, a lot of actors come in on board, but uh, that's going to come out on Nickelodeon hopefully this summer, which I'm really proud of. And uh, the new Fairly Odd Parents, a part of that. More Camp yeah. Coral, more Patrick Star show, show. I'll be doing some guest voices on that. Harvey, nice. like I said, and Nobby, love it up. Let's go over here. Um, <laughs> I, there's a show called Exploding Kittens and or God Cat. I play some characters on there, namely a character named Chorgle, who's an animatronic uh, restaurant rat, and it's a Bayou themed restaurant. So I don't know if y'all watch sports, but there's a ex-LSU football coach named Ed Orgeron, and he talked way down here like this. We're going to play football with Joe Burrow, and we're going to bring home a championship for the LSU Tigers. <laughs> so I do a voice kind of like that um, in that, and a um, couple of voices in Grimsburg, which is coming out soon. It's a Fox Bento Box show. <laughs> and um, gosh, what else? Um that's about all I can think of right now, but I always post stuff on my Instagram and also TikTok. Am I forgetting something? What have I been? Agent Elvis. I did a couple of voices in there, like a driver. And what are you kidding mm. me? Are you nuts? Get out of here. <laughs> that kind of a guy. <laughs> uh, in Super Mario Brothers, I'm the castle guard when our heroes go to meet the uh, Mushroom Princess for the first time. I'm like a guy that's like, yeah, whatever, Matt. Get out of here. I'm the guard on the right as you look at the screen. So. Right, yes. That's a <laughs> great movie. part of the additional voices. So. Yes. Um, some new, uh, some new uh, characters, hopefully for some... Uh, I could probably probably say some Pixar stuff coming up. Some smaller characters. Uh, nice. Um, awesome. Uh, back before I played Fear in the Dad's Head. The foot is down. The yeah, foot inside is out, yeah. down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah some of that and um yes like i said new fairly odd we went over that um i'm, I'm blanking here uh bad a, crimes is another is. show that's coming out that i did some voices on hmm. but i really think people are really really going to dig rock paper scissors you can probably find a little clip of it online it's really well written i play scissors mm. it's kind of mm. a version of myself but a little bit higher he's like nice. it's not fair <laughs> Come on, guys. We can't just sit around here. We have to do something. I got an idea. I think you're going to love it. You better love it. Yeah, he's really always a go-getter type of guy. So fun, fun character and a great show. Yeah. So those are some of the things that I've got coming coming out soon. Nice. Looking forward to those. Wonderful. Looking Thank you. forward to it. For sure. So working in acting and comedy, what would, say, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you faced? I think the uh, sticking with it, being uh, persistent and keeping going and um, competing with other people that are really funny and really good. And the challenges you face working in comedy or voiceover are is the disappointment of not getting a role. You know, most of the things I or we audition for, we don't get. And we're competing from, for, with friends, often in front of each other at a loop group. And so it's really weird. And you just have to forget about that and get into the spirit of being a part of this wonderful world and when you do get a job, it's like catching a fish. Um, you celebrate it, and you cook it the way you want it, and you eat it, and then you go out fishing again, you know? So the, <laughs> those are some of the yeah. challenges. The challenges of working together live, would I'd love to do that again. It's very rare these days, but the challenges were yeah. not to laugh and, and, and spoil a take. Or sometimes on Zoom, I'll laugh and spoil a take. Uh, working from home in a booth where you have to really – Work by yourself and come up with your own motivation. That's a challenge, you know, to be funny at nine in the morning when you're barely awake and your voice is tired, you know. 
Tom Kenny's a director on SpongeBob and Camp Coral, and he's tough. He, he makes you work, man. Because Tom <laughs> thinks you have Tom's energy, and you don't have Tom's energy. You have regular yeah. human energy. Tom has plutonium, uranium, radioactive, bit by a spider energy. You know, he's amazing. <laughs> 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 Hey, Carlos, I just threw the East Coast, did five shows of the band, uh, did that, uh, and are hey, you ready to go this morning? I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. But, <laughs> and yeah, your challenges are always to be professional. When you show up and you don't feel like it, you got you to gotta deliver the goods, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. yeah, sure. So what piece of advice would you give to anyone who wants to get into acting or comedy? Acting comedy, well, for voiceover specifically, I think you know about D. Bradley Baker's site mm -hmm. called I Want to Be a Voice Actor. That's a great yeah. one. I think it's do it because you love it. You know, I was doing stand-up comedy because I thought it was a means to an end. And I'll still do, but I didn't love stand-up comedy. I love voiceover, and I love being on a set when I can on camera. I just did a movie called Chris The Christmas Classic. That'll come out in November in uh, on Hulu. Mm. Um, it, nice. It's with uh, Mullen Ackerman. Um, Amy Smart, um, oh gosh, Ryan, I want to say Ryan Henson. I want to say that's his name. Uh, all kind of recognizable actors. And I got to play a, a really kind of chippy, sleazy weather guy. Hey, it's me, Big Dick Mountain. How you doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, the challenges are, or I would say if you're upcoming, really make sure you love it. So to, so to go to classes, I love scene study classes with the late, great Cliff Osman, our acting teacher. I really liked scene study. It was hard, but I loved trying to develop as an actor. I love voiceover. I love being with the people of it. I love being on the set of Reno, even though sometimes everything can get boring. It's not always exciting. You're in your trailer. You're waiting all day long to do something, and then it gets moved, and maybe they don't use you that day at all, and you drive all that way. Or... You're not, you don't have a big role in the next episode of, of SpongeBob. You maybe have you know, backup characters or background characters that are just campers going, yay, yay! So it's not like glorious and glamour. Even in some of the, the looping sessions where I was the voice in the Super Mario, we're all working together and it's a long day and you're just going, yay, Super Mario, woo! And you're like, do, do I even have a voice in the film? And so, you know, you just keep going. And because I love it, you you keep showing up every day and participating and being professional. Do stand up comedy if you feel like it. If you, that floats your boat, do an improv class if that floats your boat. Make your own stuff. Make little teeny movies. You know, make get a YouTube channel, get a TikTok channel. There's all these wonderful impressionists out there that are just amazing on TikTok, and I, I love watching them. And Jim is one of the older impressions uh, uh, doing his stuff, but. Yeah, make your make your stuff. Have fun. Be creative. Stay in it. Be professional. Keep auditioning. Get knocked down and keep getting back up again because you're gonna get knocked mm -hmm. down daily. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, back again. You have to be yeah. like, I'm back. Right. I'll be back. I must find Sarah Connor. Sarah Connor is the job. You know, you always you always go for like an android. I have to get the job, the next job. I didn't get this one, but I'll get the next one. You know, keep <laughs> definitely, going. <laughs> definitely. And turning yeah. the tables, is there a best piece of advice that you've received working in those fields? Oh, man. Uh, uh, I think with D. Bradley Baker, he said, hey, when you go in to do your job, you detonate that bomb. You make sure that you just give them everything you've got at 100% and let them know who you are. Go in that studio when you have a job, and if you're a little bit nervous, just go for it. Detonate the bomb. Mm -hmm. Blast out who you are, and that's what you do. Make sure you bring it. I think that's that's kind of what D was saying in that moment. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. So... Are there any words you'd like to say to those watching or listening who supported your work over the years? I want to say thank you. Like, like I say, it really makes a difference that you appreciate what we do because oftentimes we are the silent jazz studio musicians that nobody gets fanfare uh, for. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being a fan. And never be shy about approaching us about what you like, what you don't like. Sometimes people will say, I didn't like what you did. And you're like, okay, I tried. 
you know, that's fair. Um, and yeah, yeah, just a big warm hug of a thank you for supporting us because we love it when we get to see you at cons and, um, and, and interact and see your reaction to what we do. Because, like I said, as much as I just was over the moon to find out that Dee and Fred Tattashore were in, in um, Left 4 Dead 2, I, I, I appreciate your fandom and your, your excitement. Hmm. Yeah, that great, definitely great words. Um, mm -hmm. yes. If if people would like to uh, connect with you, where can people find you? You can find me on my Instagram page. I do a lot of how I came up with the voice at Carlos Salas Rocky on Instagram. Also on TikTok, I'm listing my con appearances. I think the next one coming up is May 7th in Lodi, California. And so for Spyro fans, I'll be there. Uh, then June 10 through 12, I want to say in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Then the last week in August at Ultracon in West Palm Beach, Florida. It's the last weekend in August. Then September 30th, pardon me, September 30th and October 1st. Is that it? That weekend? It's a Friday and a Saturday and a Sunday in Normal, Illinois, slash Bloomington, Illinois uh, for the Comics and Toys Convention, West, West Comics and Toys Convention, I think it's called. But all of those will be on my TikTok and all of those will be on my my website and Instagram for sure. You can check out where I'll be. And that's where you can find me doing my voiceover stuff. Nice. And links to your website nice. and social medias will be in the description down below. Yes. So, right. so, so since we're about to wrap up the last question that we ask all of our guests at the end that Jake is about to ask, go ahead, Jake. Yes. So of course this podcast is called Jake's hyper nostalgia. So when you think of nostalgia, what do you think of, or where you can say in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia. Nostalgia. Let's see. Let's do this, Rocco. I think <clears throat> nostalgia is anything like a toy or a show or a memory that makes you happy and want to relive it in your mind. Ah, uh, definitely. Well said, Rocco. Awesome. awesome. Well said. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I think Rocco could say it better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, just did. I just did i know leave me alone <laughs> stop stop looking over my shoulder i'm not looking over your shoulder Put me here. well carlos thank you so much for taking the time to do this yes yeah. thank you so much it's, it's been a pleasure and and let me know and i'll promote it uh when it's awesome. gonna air and we'll I'll put it all on my yeah. pages and, and tell people to look out for it yeah it's awesome. Right. awesome thank you and, and, and i just want to say this carlos and thank you so much for for what you've done to be a part of our lives and keep up your great work and see what's next for you. No, I likewise back at you for being such fans and, uh, and supporting us. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And to all of our it means a lot. viewers and listeners, this brings another episode of Jake's Happiness Hell to show to a close. We absolutely enjoyed our time with Carlos Alas Rocky. Yes. Thank you so much again. It's been a blast. Thanks, everybody. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Yes. Bye, Thank Carlos. You see you, Carlos, have a great rest of course, enjoy day. the rest of your day. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. 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 And as always, remember, you know, look out for more great interviews and remember to, what yes, is it, Jake? Keep Nostalgia Alive. Keep Nostalgia Alive. Yes. Keep Nostalgia yes. Alive, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.